and welcome to The Right Stuff. I'm the Queen Parker J. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, we're going to be talking to my re my guest co-host and contributor today, Professor Jean-Pierre Isboats. He is the author of the book, Mapping America. I can't wait to tell you about it in just a few moments. What's unique about this episode is that we have an audio and a visual component to this episode because we're going to be talking about maps. And if you're anything like me, you don't know how to read maps. So you may not understand how important maps are to understanding the history of a region of a town, of a city, even the neighborhood. So can you take that information and make it even bigger to understanding how the United States of America began? I can't wait to get into it. As always, want to thank you for your support. We have been showcasing Christian authors worldwide for the past nine years. And as God gives us grace, we'll continue to do so. To find out how you can help out, simply go to patreon.com slash write stuff and see what you can do. And as always, we covet your prayers. To stay up to date with PJC Media, simply go to pjcmedia.net, click on that pink follow button, and you'll never ever have to miss a show. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring my guests on today. Professor, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you, Parker. It is such an honor to have you. I want to thank Heather for the connection. She has sent me some wonderful guests as a lovely PR representative for her authors. And I want to thank her for the connection. And what's really interesting about this particular show is that we are going to be talking about maps. And as of right now, I don't think I've ever done a show where we focus clearly on maps. And this is significant because you're going to be showing us how the maps helped build and create America. So I can't wait to tell about it, tell our listeners and viewers about this as well. But before I do that, I always want to give our audience an opportunity to know who you are. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a historian, um, uh, um, both in art as well as in history of, uh, of the world, and I'm also a biblical archaeologist. I have written a lot of book about biblical archaeology for National Geographic, uh, books that your uh, audience may be familiar with, such as The Biblical World and In the Footsteps of Jesus. And uh, um, since uh, The Biblical World was called The Atlas of the Bible, um, a dear friend of mine, Neil Asbury, who lives in Florida, reached out to me and said, can we do a book about uh, how America came about as seen through the prism of maps? Because you've written a book about the biblical world in, as an atlas. I'd like to do the same thing about the United States. And I flew down to Florida, where Neil Asbury lives. Neil Asbury is an entrepreneur who happens to be also uh, the owner of but it's perhaps the largest private collection of maps about America from the very beginning, from the Renaissance, from the age of exploration. And we put our heads together. Uh, he as the map connoisseur, me as the historian, and the outcome of that was uh, the book Mapping America, which was published by uh, Apollo Publishers just last year. Now, I want to give our listeners the full title of this book. It's called Mapping America, The Incredible Story and Stunning Hand-Colored Maps and Engravings That Created the United States. Now, it's sold, your books total have sold over 2 million copies. So you're pretty well known. But this is a really unique exploration into our history. And I want to have our viewers and listeners understand why they should invest their time and energy into picking up this story about the United States. Sure. I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it's very funny because as a historian, I often read uh, books, of course, by my peers about this period. And we're talking about not only the age of the American Revolution, but the years that preceded it. And uh, in a book I picked up the other day, uh, the author said, it's real pity that we don't have any images. We don't have any video footage, you know, film footage of the American Revolutionary War. There, there were no uh, uh, photographers embedded in the troops because, of course, this technology did not exist. But what historians typically ignore is the pivotal role of maps. And as we will discuss in this conversation, maps played a unique role in not only the birth of America and the colonization of America, 
but also in, in the war that ultimately brought us independence. It was the British who relied very much on maps in their strategy to defeat the colonists. And as we will see, that actually backfired and uh, led in many ways to their defeat and the independence of the United States. You brought something up that I want to touch base on. One of the reasons why we have so much information about the Civil War in the United States is because the technology had performed better. We have pictures, we have maps, and that all comes together to bring about a more cohesive idea of what was going on during the Civil War. So there is something to be said that we don't have those moving pictures. We don't have the the steels of that time period, but we do have maps and lets us know that the information is out there. We just have to look for it. And with the American Revolutionary War, we are talking about the birth of a country, but the birth of a country still has its bedrock in British um, ideas, British class systems, British understandings of science and technology, military, all that comes together. But one thing that is spread throughout this whole story is the need for exploration. And I think that's where the beginning of our story should take place. Why did Europeans begin to explore the new world? Absolutely. And I can show you some visuals if that would work for you right now. Sure. I'm going to go ahead and put the share screen on right now. I have to do this. All right. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and share that with us. And for our listeners, while a Professor Isbot is getting his screen together, we are doing a visual aspect of this topic as well. It'll be on our YouTube channel. Very good. So Mapping America is really the idea of looking through the story of the birth of America that we all know so well through the unique prism of maps, which really nobody has ever done before. And the reason why Neil and I decided to write this book is that maps were for a very long time an art that had really stalled in the Roman times. Um, in the, the second century, a Roman geographer called Ptolemy wrote a, a book, created a book of maps of the world as it was seen at that time. And those maps, believe it or not, were still valid in the 15th century. In 1482, um, a German cartographer called Leinhard Halle uh, published a map, which was basically the same as the, the Roman map produced some 15, year, uh, 15 centuries earlier. And what unleashed this idea that we could explore the world on our own terms is, of course, the Renaissance. The Renaissance, which uh, was born in Florence in the 15th century, allowed artists, scientists, scholars, poets, writers to look at the world unhindered by, uh, by Christian dogma. Now, I'm not saying that they were in any way anti-Christian, not so, absolutely not. These uh, cartographers and artists and people like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci were deeply religious people, but they did feel a new urge to look at the world as they saw it empirically without necessarily being dictated to by the church at the time, whether the world was flat, for example, which clearly it was not. And so you see that the Renaissance then stimulated a whole new urge to learn about the world around us, to, to really imagine what it was like. And it so happened that this coincided, this, this new desire to understand the world with the invention of the printing press. The printing press, which, you know, there's an argument about when exactly it took place, but let's say it took place in 1487. And the idea of the printing press was that suddenly knowledge that had been limited to the very small elite groups in the country, people who could afford tutors for their children, wealthy people, the elites, suddenly that knowledge became uh, available to the people at large. And so it broke the monopoly on learning among the title classes of Europe. And part of that was a new desire to go and explore the idea that you could actually go on a ship and steer it into the unknown 
and see what what could develop. I mean, obviously, Christopher Columbus is a great example, but there were many others who followed in his wake and set their sail uh, to the West in the hope of what they thought was reaching the Indies, which was becoming very important at that time as a sort of as a source of spices. People don't really uh, recognize that, I think, often enough, but the reason why Columbus and other seafarers like him tried to find a new route to the Indies was because Europe was growing. The population was growing and there were no refrigerators. You know, you couldn't just put your food in the refrigerator. The only way to preserve foodstuff for particularly a growing population were spices. So spices were really a key ingredient to help Europe grow. And of course, Christopher Columbus was the first one to explore the new world, but many, many followed uh, after him. And so this map, uh, the first map uh, where you see America appear for the first time, in addition to the continents of Europe, Africa, and Asia, the three continents that were recognized by the Romans. The first map where you have a sliver <laughs> appearing on the far left that says um, America, based on, of course, Americo Vespucci, uh, is, this, uh, is a, a map created by a man called Walze Müller, in, uh, in 1507. And of course, at that time, nobody knew what America looked like. And so in this particular map by Walt St. Müller, America is just a tiny little sliver because all they did was they only saw the coastline, right? So they had no idea what was behind it. And then you see that as these uh, explorations continue, you have the Spanish for the first time landing in North America. And uh, uh, and they called the territory that uh, they they colonized La Florida, uh, which uh, is actually a lot more than Florida today. It was the coast of uh, Louisiana, part of Texas. All of that was uh, colonized by uh, the uh, Spanish, and uh, uh, published the the a map of La Florida was published by the very famous Flemish cartographer Ortilius in 1504. But it, the interesting thing is this, that the, the, the Spanish didn't weren't really interested in building permanent settlements. Well, they had a mission here and there, but they weren't interested in actually settling and developing the, the territory around them. All they wanted was silver and gold. That's why they, that's what they were after. They were after precious metals. They weren't after necessarily settling there and building cities. And so, for example, uh, in, a, in a map that was created by Diego Gutierrez in 1562, you see the tremendous territory that the Spaniards conquered in the 16th century. And much of that territory was basically just colonized along the coastline, along the coastline of Latin America in this case. And um, according to Spanish records, uh, their quest for gold and silver was indeed satisfied. Some 45,000 tons of silver were found in mines such as Potosi in the Andes and others in Mexico. So the Spanish weren't really in initially interested in creating a new territory for themselves where people could colonize and move over and settle and harvest and so forth. They were just interested in extracting the riches from the region. Uh, Let me interrupt you real quickly sure. before we go into your next slide, because you can see this being mirrored currently in our time, but our frontier now isn't what's on earth, it's what's in space. And I can remember seeing a article about an asteroid that had some type of mineral that we could actually go to this particular asteroid and collect the minerals and, and, uh, um, like-minded things from this asteroid. So more about mining resources to bring back to earth. And so we see this mind, this concept of resources for civilization. We see that mindset here. And for our listeners out there, those of you who are listening to our audio podcast, 
uh, Professor Isbots is sharing with us his presentation about the various maps. And when you look at these maps, dear listener, they are scrumptious. They're exciting and they're full of imagination. When you see their depiction of America, it literally is a sliver of land because as you said, they're looking at the coastline, supposing, oh, this is America, whatever that is. And then they come over here and they start to see new things. And that leads us to your next slide here. Absolutely. And as you can see, uh, uh, you know, and they imagined that there were all kinds of sea monsters in these oceans, you know. There so be dragons. Map, there are dragons in the oceans because the peril of these long voyages became expressed in the perceived imagination of dragons and all kinds of terrible uh of uh, animals that uh, could uh, do harm to these seafarers. The great uh, negative effect of the Colombian invasions was, of course, that many pre-Columbian civilizations, such as the beautiful uh, civilization of the Maya. Uh, I wrote a lot about the Maya in my book, uh, The Ultimate Visual History of the World, which was published by National Geographic last year. It's a very big book, but what I try to do in that book is talk about civilizations, including civilizations that no longer exist. And we have the beautiful uh, Maya civilization, which had writing, which had uh, monumental architecture, which had laws, uh, the Inca, the Aztec cultures. They were all destroyed by these conquistadoras. So there is a real flip side to the, uh, con the conquest by the Europeans in the Americas. Many of these tribal civilizations were destroyed, not just by the sword, but most people actually died as a result of disease, such as smallpox, which was introduced uh, by the Europeans. And of course, these uh, American tribes had, had no resistance to these particular diseases. They were all uh, destroyed as a result of that, which is a great shame. And we should always remember that the colonization of South America and to some extent North America also uh, was accompanied by, with, with, by great uh, war and great violence against the natives uh, that lived there. And so you see that the eastern seaboard of the United States is then settled not just by the Spanish, but it is the, the English and the Dutch who concentrated uh, on that. Uh, the French were in, still coming at that time. Uh, Nouvelle France, New France was still uh, in the offing. But in 1625, the Dutch uh, settled on an island that the local Indians called Manahata. <laughs> and they bought that Manahata. Of course, that became Manhattan. Uh, they bought that from the local Lenape Indians for 60 guilders, which was about, let's say, $6,000 in today's currency. And right away Incredible. on Manhattan, <laughs> they, they began to build this town. And uh, Nicholas Visser uh, created a map of this region. And he showed a little, a little snapshot. We would call it a selfie today a little snapshot of, of what Manhattan looked like. It looked just like a Dutch village, you know, with a windmill <laughs> and a church and people uh, fishing. Uh, it, it could have been just any coastal village in Holland at that time. And that that was the beginning of New York City, uh, just as a, as a very modest uh, Dutch little city. And uh, they called that area around Manhattan uh, Nova Belgica, New New Belgium or New New Netherlands uh, in Latin, if you translate it like that. Uh, and uh, and then of course the e settlement of the Eastern Seaboard continued. Uh, one of the earliest uh, colonies that actually you know remained was established in North America around Chesapeake Bay, the Chesapeake Bay, which would play such an important role in the American Revolutionary War. And by this time, the British had sort of overtaken from the Dutch. So a map created by John Thornton in 1685 of the Eastern Seaboard is, is one of the first maps where the Dutch names of this area are replaced by English names. And so you see that now the English influence uh, begins to become paramount 
And here again, the English uh, came to to settle. They, they wanted to live there. They they weren't out to just uh, extract lots of uh, uh, wealth from that region. Of course, the wealth that was there was largely agricultural in nature. There was lots of fertility. There was lots of water, unlike in Europe. Vast fields that were suited for agriculture. There was no gold. There was no silver in North America. The only other uh, uh, object of any interest was fur. And fur was, of course, uh, mainly harvested by the local Indians, by the local Native Americans. And so you see that the first contacts between the British and the Native American tribes of the region always involved the trade of fur as well as foodstuffs. Uh, Jamestown uh, nearly perished because of the lack of foodstuffs. There was not a whole lot of uh, game around Jamestown. And so the uh, colonists of Jamestown largely survived because of the trade for corn and other foodstuffs that the local tribes uh, cultivated. And it's interesting because you mentioned earlier uh, the makeup of, of early America. You know, uh, there were three main territories in this, on, along the English uh, American seaboard at that time. But you had, of course, the first of all, the New England colonies, and they had uh, been colonized by religious groups, including Quaker and Puritan sects. And, and they had come to America for the purpose of creating a, a new society, an egalitarian society that was going to be based on uh, their religious values, very strict religious values, you know, and and. Uh, the observation of the Sabbath was very important to them. And so they settled in, in the north. In the middle of the colonies, which is today, let's say, the states of New York, Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland, and so forth, that was different. The people who settled there were largely farmers. They were tradesmen, tanners, uh, shoemakers, you know, every, uh, every uh, everyday tra tradesmen who fled uh, Europe, again, largely because of persecution. So these were particularly uh, Lutheran uh, or Huguenots uh, from France. Uh, Calvinism in France at the time was referred to as uh, the Huguenots. They uh, fled the, um, the territory of France because the Cardinal Richelieu, the ruler of the time, was persecuting uh, French Calvinists, so they fled. But there were also Irish and English Catholics who basically came to Middle America because they could have land that they could not have in Europe. Uh, the, in, in Europe at the time, the feudal system of land being given to farmers in tenancy was still very much alive. And they wanted to own their land. They wanted to develop their land, own their land, create families take care of their families and grow in small communities. And so you see that the middle colonies, unlike the North in New England, became very egalitarian, very uh, very democratic, we would call it today, uh, very much uh, an emerging middle class. The South, on the other hand, uh, was very much a mirror image of England. So there you had still very much, very severe class distinctions you had a gentry, an aristocracy that owned vast plantations uh, and controlled much of the political sphere. There was hardly any democracy there, in fact, none. <laughs> uh, and these landowners, they actually controlled the religious scene. They were the ones who appointed Anglican preachers, for example. And, uh, and so much of the South was completely dependent on, on these landowners. And Let me stop you right there real sure. quickly. I want to just interject here. What was really fascinating about this is that you kind of see where later on there will be these divisions happening because mm -hmm. you have the New England colonies, particularly with the religious sect, dominating those areas. And then you have the middle colonies being dominated by another religious thing. So you have Protestant and Catholic, you know, they've been fighting for a long time, still are. <laughs> so uh, you have them fighting. Then you have the South, which was just a mirror reflection of what was going on in Great Britain, which is why you had that the 
the class system there. And so just looking at maps, that's what I want our listeners and viewers to realize. We're just looking at the maps and with the maps and understanding the history of the exploration and colonization here, you start to see the story of America. I wanna ask you a question, Professor. With all these European European countries coming over to America, America begins to represent something. It begins to represent freedom freedom in many different ways. No longer are they constrained by their homeland. They get to go to the new world to gain wealth, to gain freedom, to have a more egalitarian society, to do what they want to do. Do you think that spirit of freedom is the DNA that still exists within our country today? Oh, absolutely. You 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 really identify something that's very important, and I'm I'm so glad that you point that out because what happened is that once these colonists settled uh, uh, in America, the British government back in London sort of let them do their own thing, uh, what they called benign neglect. You know, they were they had their hands full with lots of wars that were being fought on European soil at that time. England was, at any given point in time, always at war with someone, <laughs> you know, whether it was the French or the Germans or the Prussians or Spain. And so you see that these uh, communities that settled themselves on the Eastern Seaboard developed their own governance. They developed their own assemblies. They developed their own forms of elections. And so they very early on, unlike Spanish settlements, for example, which were very tightly controlled by the Spanish government, the English settl settlers, the English colonists, very early on developed their own forms of democracy, which was certainly not present in their homeland. And that became very important because then later on, and uh, of course I'm skipping uh, a few centuries ahead, but later on and suddenly, the British do want to enforce their taxes and their laws and their governance on these colonists. They say, hey, wait a minute. You've let us do our own thing for all these years. Now, all of a sudden, you want to come in and tell us what to do? That, that is not, that's not how we were raised. And so it's, it's that beginning of that seed of freedom, as you call it, was absolutely planted in these years when the British just let these colonists do what they ever they wanted to do because they were distracted by their wars that they were fighting in the, in, the, in Europe itself. Now, well, go ahead, because this is fascinating. Please continue. So uh, what happens then is that now we're looking at a, a map by Willem Blau, America Nova Tabula, which is Latin for a new map of America. And you can slowly see how much more of America now is known. There are still large parts of North America, uh, the northern part, uh, Oregon, the, uh, Idaho, those states, that they're still unexplored. The coastline, which was still Spanish at the time, is merely indicated as a coast. There is absolutely no geographical detail there. But on the eastern side, of the of what would become the United States, the eastern side of America, you see there is a tremendous amount of activity in terms of the indication of rivers, of hills, of cities, because all of these explorers, all of this activity would ultimately come back to Europe. Uh, and of course, that's where, uh, you know, at, at the port, uh, they would be looking out for any ships coming back from America. And these cartographers would run over to these captains of these boats and say, what did you see? What did you see? And they would make their notes. We would call it data today. And then they would rush back to their studio and expand on the maps of the Americas as it was known at that time. So it's so wonderful to see in these maps and there were a number of them, uh, we call it the golden age of cartography. Most of it was concentrated in the Netherlands uh, of the 17th century with, uh, with cartographers like Blau, Hondius, uh, Visser. Also in France, which uh, of course at this point gets really into the act of developing their colonies, which is of course today 
uh, Quebec uh, in uh, Canada. Uh, but at that time, Nouvelle France, New France, ran all the way down to the west side of the Ohio Valley. So a large part of North America, uh, Amérique septentrionale, as it was called in French, uh, was, was basically uh, a, a division on the one hand of English colonists, mostly along the coasts, and French colonists, which had settled east of the uh, Ohio Valley, east of the Appalachians, uh, I'm sorry, west of, I'm sorry, west of the Ohio Valley, west of the Appalachians, and running all the way to what is today Quebec. So at a certain point in time, uh, these French cartographers became very interested in developing what was going on in North America as well. The interesting thing, though, is that uh, maps then became artifacts. They became works of beauty. Here is, um, I'm showing you a beautiful painting by Johannes Vermeer. There is a great exhibit going on right now. For those of you who live in in, in or around Washington, D.C., I urge you to go to Washington, D.C., because there is a beautiful exhibit going on about Vermeer, Johannes Vermeer, uh, as well as in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Um, and uh, this painting shows a large map on the wall, not necessarily because these people were mariners or merchants, but by this time, and we're talking the middle of the 17th century, maps had become paintings. They, you know, they were printed uh, using a printed press, and then they were hand colored by hand. Beautiful colored territories were colored in. Uh, very often they had ornamental, what we call cartouches. These are ornamental areas where you could uh, depict a few Indians or a few merchants or a view of the city as Nicholas Visser had done. And so these maps really became works of art and were traded as such uh, in, in Holland uh, at that time. But uh, the American rebellion uh, against their overlords in Britain uh, was sparked by a number of things. I mentioned earlier that for a long time, the English colonists uh, benefited from benign neglect uh, from the English uh, government in London, as long as the ships filled with, uh, with uh, wheat and sugar, particularly sugar was a very important commodity at the time that was harvested in both Central America and North America, as long as sugar and oats and wheat and all these other foodstuffs arrived in British ports on time, where, of course, they were taxed up to a point uh, just before the American Revolution, imports from British America before the Revolutionary War totaled $1 billion uh, in today's currency, $1 oh, wow. billion dollars per year. So uh, England had become very dependent on North America, particularly because its treasury was always running dry because of its wars on the European soil. So one reason why these Brits did not want to give up on North America was not just about pride or proprietary sense of ownership. It was because they needed, they needed the Americas for uh, the financial uh, revenues that they uh, have. Here is uh, a, a map uh, where you of New Virginia. Uh, and of course, uh, there is a typical image here of a young, beautiful young Native American girl, Pocahontas. Uh, the story was, now I gotta tell you, scholars don't always agree whether this story is true or not, but let me, it's a great story nevertheless. That Pocahontas uh, uh, was, uh, well, I don't say kidnapped, but uh, came over to the English colonists where the, she was acculturated. She married a, uh, a settler called uh, John Rolfe. And the idea that a Native American girl, beautiful as she was, could really become acculturated to English or American civilization uh, was so incredibly interesting from a PR point of view that they sent her to Britain and they dressed her up in beautiful clothes 
and she made the rounds of all the balls and the galas and whatnot uh, as an example of the civilizing function of the colonization of, uh, of America. And then, of course, the wars of Europe spilled over into, the, very sadly, into America itself. English, England and France were at loggerheads. They uh, were involved in multiple wars, including the Seven Years' War, which was one of the most devastating wars ever fought on European soil up to that time. And as these conflicts spilled over, France and England uh, on, in America uh, entered into a, a war. Uh, now, uh, the French ultimately were defeated by the British soldiers who rushed to the defense, of course, of their American colonists. Uh, but uh, the cost of that war uh, was tremendous. Now, as a result, much of what had been New France, Nouvelle France, uh, became American. So all the territory to the east of the Appalachians, the territory east of, uh, um, of that whole area of the Ohio Valley, all the way up to Quebec became American. Many other territories of the French in this region and elsewhere became British. So all of a sudden, from one day to the next almost, Britain became this vast empire, this huge empire. Uh, and uh, it, that costs money to maintain an empire like that. And the treasury uh, in back in London had been depleted because of the cost of sending expeditionary forces to America to fight the French. And that's why we, had, we see this call coming in London saying, hey, listen, we, we, we saved these uh, American colonists from the French. It's time for them to pay back. It's time for them to pay for the privilege of having these... Uh, British forces there to protect them. And uh, there is a wonderful map uh, that was created by an American-born, one of the first maps by an American-born artist called John Mitchell. And uh, he wanted to clearly delineate the boundaries between the English colonies and New France as the war was raging, which is this beautiful hand-colored map. And uh, it showed that at this point, the English influence had extended well over the Appalachian Mountains in the Ohio Valley, which sparked that war. Interestingly enough, even after the war, even after much of this territory then became British, this map was still used uh, by the negotiating parties during the Revolutionary War, uh, just prior to the Paris Treaty, which settled the American uh, Revolutionary War and gave peace and made America an independent state, the map that was used to, to delineate the uh, spheres of influence of the various parties was this Mitchell map. So this, this beautiful map uh, in color clearly tried to delineate uh, the spheres of influence, a very politically important part of the story. Well, then war broke out, as we all know, and what is interesting? Professor, let me stop you here real quick because sure. I want our listeners who are listening to our audio podcast to click on the YouTube link in the show notes because these are some gorgeous maps and really interesting histories of the world that was before we have the modern age now. And it's really fascinating to see how all these factions came together to create our country. We see the we see the good, we see the bad, we see the little out there, the little, especially the maps depicting America, earlier maps. And it literally is like a fantasy land. It's just, you know, there be dragons and sea monsters. And then you see the conflicts of people who have never seen, uh, let's say like the Inca, the Maya and Aztecs, they never seen that type of civilization before, being alien to them and how that has tragic results. And then you have um, the, the homeland and how they're like, okay, we're running out of money because we keep fighting and we go over here. So all these things are adding up to the story that is America. And Professor Isbutz is only touching on a surface level of what's in this book. So I'm going to encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to pick up your copy of Mapping America by Professor Isbutz and your co-author, Neil, I'm sorry? Neil Asbury. 
at Neil Asbury. Go ahead and pick it up today because these maps are absolutely gorgeous. So go ahead and continue your presentation here. Yes, we're coming to the end of the presentation because um, at this point, you can see at this point, maps now become very detailed. But maps now gain a very important new function. As we saw in the beginning, maps basically were the, the projection of what explorers saw in the, in the late Renaissance. Then maps uh, gained a whole new function as works of art in the 17th century. And, uh, beautiful cartography. Uh, People had maps on the wall to decorate their homes. Then maps gained a, a role in, in a political sense to delineate the spheres of influence of the various European powers that were vying for influence, competing with one another on American soil. And now in the fourth stage, maps gain another function again, which is military. And this is a, a wonderful map, uh, which is owned by Neil Asbury and which is included uh, in, in the book, where you literally have a battle map, a battle map of the order of battle. On the one hand, the British. On the other hand, the American forces under Washington. And th these maps would be hand uh, drawn uh, by British cartographers on site overlooking the bay, they could see exactly where the various forces were, were um, stationed. Then these hand-drawn maps, believe it or not, were sent by fast ship, a schooner, across the ocean, which took six weeks, to London, where they were engraved. You couldn't give the king a hand-drawn map. It had to be properly engraved with lots of embellishments. And then King George III finally six and a half weeks later, saw this map. And then based on this on maps like these, he would make his strategic decisions. And then of course, six weeks to, for the ship to return back to the American shores. So maps now became very, very important in making strategic decisions. Here is a, uh, we have this in the book, a hand-drawn map, uh, which shows the action between uh, at Princeton in New Jersey, the famous raid on Princeton by General Green, where he routed the British regiments led by Colonel Charles Marwood. Now, how Princeton. old is this map that we're looking at here? That's hand drawn. So this this map is uh, two two and a half uh, two and a half centuries old, and uh, it is thanks to uh, uh, fate, but also the uh, incredible collecting genius of Neil Asbury that this map um, uh, that we have that in the book uh, maps like these are incredibly old uh, some of them are in the Library of Congress Library of Congress has been very keen to collect these and sometimes maps such as these appear on uh, auctions uh, there are several auctions of maps going on uh, both in this country and as well as in Europe and even in Asia Maps have become almost as uh, important as an investment opportunity as works of art. <laughs> so uh, this is where they come from. And we are so incredibly privileged to have uh, a, a literally a, a, a quickly sketched in the midst of the flying cannonballs and the muskets firing you know you have a map drawn in the in the heat of battle and uh, and that so connection. We have Mr. Yeah. Asbury must be having just that connection to time. And this is written by someone who didn't even know that today we'd be talking about it in the year 2023. How incredible is that? That's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. It, it just Ma sends chills down my spine. Yes, thank you. Anyway, the, the, um, as the war was in full swing, uh, J.B. Elliott uh, made a map of the theater of war between the British and the 13 United Colonies uh, of North America. And we believe that this is the first map. It was a French map because uh, the French were, of course, on the side of the American colonists, not necessarily because they loved the American colonists so much, but because they wanted to stick it to the to Yes, the stick it eye to the British, yes. <laughs> stick it to the British. <laughs> and, so, and so this beautiful French map, is the very first time where the word Etats-Unis, that's French for the United States, 
appears. Can you imagine that? I mean, this is the first time, the very first time where the word United States appears in print in a beautiful map. And so this, of course, is an extremely valuable map. Maps like these cost anywhere from fifty to $100,000. They are extremely valuable. And I'm ending with this map, the John Mellish map, because at the time when the Peace of Paris was signed in 1783, America still had not progressed beyond the Ohio Valley. All of this area to the Midwest and West was terra incognita. But John Mellish created a map projecting the idea that all of the continental United States would one day become one country, even though that was still very much far in the future. And he based himself once again on key data by explorers such as Stephen Long, Lewis and Clark. They explored the West, they came back, all this data was compiled. And Thomas Jefferson, the president of the United States, would always show the map to every foreign diplomat who came uh, to the United States to learn about this new country. And he would show this map, even though the idea of a unified continental United States was still very far in the future, he would show this map and say, this is our manifest destiny. And that's my story. I love the way you ended that because it gives us so much hope that what the founding fathers and what those before the founding fathers came together to bring about this country and that during this time of a lot of division, if we go back in time and watch the story, we see the ups, the downs, the bright spots, the dark spots. We see it all work together to create this thing called the United States. And we should really be proud to be Americans. I personally am of the opinion, we don't always have to focus on the negative. The negative only begets the negative. But if we focus on the positive, what happens without, now mind you, I'm not saying disregard the bad things that have happened, but you try to build from them. And so I definitely want to thank you, Professor Isbots, for just sharing this presentation with our viewers and our listeners, for those of you listening on the audio podcast. And I'm just going to read a quick blip about this because in this richly illustrated book, renowned rare map connoisseur, Neil Asbury, and National Geographic historian, Professor Jean-Pierre Isbots, provide a fresh retelling of America's genesis using maps. And that's what most of all this is about is maps. So you only got just a taste of it via the presentation that Professor Isba showed you. But go ahead, pick up your copy of Mapping America, the incredible story and stunning hand-colored maps and engravings that created the United States. Now, Professor, whenever I end this show, I always want our listeners to have an opportunity to use the gift that God gave them to go ahead and write. And you're writing something that will hope, hopefully bring a fresh take of unity that was always a part of the American spirit, that was always a part of what people were going out to explore, that America represented freedom and it represented opportunity and it still does and it still can. And me being a sci-fi girl, Professor, I have to go to space because space is the ultimate frontier and there's going to be opportunity there as well so encourage those authors out there who may be sitting on an idea similar to this or any idea tell them to go ahead and write absolutely i'm uh, uh even though i'm retired as a professor i'm i'm now professor emeritus at my university fielding graduate university i'm still the head of the university press uh, at my university, and I always encourage uh, my students, uh, alumni, uh, to to write. I mean, we have, I mean, young people, old people, whatever age you are, you have opportunities right now to publish your work that I did not have when I was a student in a different galaxy, in a different century <laughs> in the 1970s. You know, I didn't have the opportunities to publish my work uh, you had to go through an agent and you had to be picked up by one of the big publishers. Uh, today, anyone can publish their work in all these incredible different platforms that we have. So I would encourage anyone who is listening, write your memoirs, write your story, put them to paper, 
and then have it published by any of the wonderful independent publishers that we have today. There is no reason why you could not see your work in print or as an ebook. All these wonderful ways, technologies that exist today. So I encourage your listeners and your viewers to grab your pen, grab your keyboard, and to express yourself in any way that you want. I have to guess I have to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying thank you so much, Professor, for being with me today on the show. Really enjoyed having you. Can't wait to have you back and have you back real soon. Well, thank you, Parker, for having me. It's been a pleasure. And to our viewer and listener today, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this special episode titled Mapping America, the Incredible Story and Stunning Hand-Colored Maps and engravings that created the United States. What I really liked about this particular show is that it shows a cycle about something. Now, Professor, you may be a little shocked about what I'm about to say right here, but if you notice that when the people came over from the European countries to come to America, they were doing resources, and then they started to settle, then they started to grow, and then there's a fight to keep their independence. In the same way for we authors, in the day, the main publishers, well, let me back up. Back in the day, the common person didn't know how to read or write. They didn't have that opportunity. And then the printing press came and gave us the ability to read for everybody. It wasn't just for the elite. And back in the day, it used to be just the publishers who were the gatekeepers of the publishing industry. And now Amazon came along. We have to give them credit where credit is due. Amazon came along and now anybody can self-publish. It doesn't have the stigma that it used to have back in the day. So what are you doing with the gift that God gave you? Go ahead, pick up the pen and write stuff. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of The Right Stuff. I'm the Queen Parker J, and you have a wonderful, absolutely glorious, blessed day.